plasmidic reactions. So it isn't just aluminum and iron oxide. There are other mechanisms. But the one that people generally speak of when they talk about thermite is the mixture of aluminum and iron oxide. An example would be that in 1984 there was a patent issued for thermite cutter charges to be used in building demolitions that could shoot molten iron through the structural steel in milliseconds. The FEMA uh, Appendix C uh, information, which is one of the things that really started me questioning things here, uh, a few of the points that I'd like to talk about there uh, to fill you guys in on as to why I was so interested in this. The FEMA Appendix C um, that I'm referring to here was basically a metallurgical study. There were two or three, I forget exactly, beams that were found in the debris pile that had, um, they'd been melted. There were sections of them that clearly showed melting. They had uh, sections that were thinned away, and there were actually holes through them, and some of the ends were just melted away or even possibly evaporated away. Um, when I started to look into the report, basically uh, what the metallurgists and scientists at WPI found was that the steel was being attacked intergranularly, uh, preferentially, by a eutectic mixture of iron, iron oxide, and iron sulfide. Um, that's basically what thermite can do. Normal thermite will produce iron, iron oxide um, in the molten form, but if you add sulfur to it, which is what's called thermate in the trade business, you just add a bit of sulfur, it also produces iron sulfide. And that again lowers the melting point through forming a eutectic. And it just basically makes the uh, steel melt at a lower temperature. So instead of having to bring the steel up to 1500 centigrade, you can slice through it with material that's at 900 or 1000 degrees centigrade. So when I saw that in the FEMA report, you know, that there was actually melted steel and jet fuel under normal conditions, or really it's just the most aberrant of conditions that can produce those types of temperatures, uh, it's just not what should have happened inside of the World Trade Centers from the fires that I saw, that any steel should have been melted whatsoever. And uh, when I saw those pictures and the work that they did, they talked about it that one of the comments that the professors made was that the melting of the steel could have happened either before the buildings fell or it could have happened after the buildings fell. They weren't really sure, but they left both conjectures open. Um, my contention based on finding thermite residue in the dust is that it happened before. It didn't happen after in the, in the fires that ensued in the rubble pile afterwards. It's the, all the characteristics of the microspheres along with what I see in the attack of the, uh, the beams that were actually found tell me that thermite was involved in melting that, uh, those steel beams. Scientists opinion and, uh, you know, more and more people are coming forward. Engineers and scientists from all over the world are looking into this, and each one has a specialty of his own and is an expert in that. And they look at the, you know, how that specialty reflects on, or how the official story re reflects on their knowledge. And uh, they usually have to step up and call BS. Also, remember, we just had that. Um, insider expose by Tony or Lieutenant Colonel Tony Schaffer uh, saying that the 9-11 commissioners all had some axe to grind, were all protecting some interests, and that the commissioners themselves say that the 9-11 commission, commission report was completely flawed. They said that the NORAD and the military lied to them in response to their questions. Um, and, you know, it's funny, I argued with this directed energy guy, uh, and I finally said, hey, well, you know, an investigation will determine, you know, the amount of involvement of a directed energy weapon or, or the explosives or whatever. He came back, I, don't you know an investigation's already been done? Judy Woods has done an investigation. And, uh, you know, that's kind of apples and oranges because I was talking about a criminal investigation. Now, there's a distinct difference there. A criminal investigation involves law enforcement. It involves subpoena power. People have to testify under the penalty of perjury. And, of course, law enforcement has the, you know, the carrot of immunity that they can offer to the underlings. You know, we'll, we'll let you go. We'll set you up with a new identity somewhere. And you just tell us exactly what you were supposed to do and who told you to do it. 
you know, and then they move up the ladder and find that out, and they, they, they'll find out how it was planned and who did it and why. But, you know, don't let them divert you when you start talking about a, a criminal investigation that every murder has one. How come this murder doesn't? You know, the first page of the 9-11 Commission report says that they are not assessing blame. That, well, then it's not a criminal investigation of any kind, is it? So, anyway, let's get on. This, is, this next interview here is with Stephen Jones, who was the famous one that first talked about the red-gray trips. So, anyway, we'll show the first of two parts of Stephen Jones, and then at the end of the show, the last ten minutes, we'll open it up for any phone calls. So go ahead. There's, here's Stephen Jones. My name is Stephen Jones, a physicist. I received my uh, PhD in physics from Vanderbilt University in 1978, so I've been at this for over 30 years, studying various uh, subjects. Uh, I like to study those things that are of, have an impact on society wherever I can, such as fusion energy. That's been my bread and butter for many years. Uh, in fact, uh, began that probably in about 1979, my research into fusion, uh, various kinds of fusion, starting with hot fusion, then muon catalyzed fusion, metal catalyzed fusion. And I'm still very interested in alternative uh, energy methods. I've published papers in Scientific American, which was a paper about muon catalyzed fusion. I've published pa papers in Nature, a British publication, and uh, several papers there. I published in Physical Review Letters. And so I have some awareness of the importance of peer review. And uh, I can say, in all honesty, that my first paper on 9-11 research uh, met with considerable flack. And it was reviewed, uh, peer reviewed, uh, very heavily, actually. And um, before uh, publication, it was, uh, it was thoroughly peer-reviewed. Uh, one of those peer reviews happened when I spoke at the Utah Academy of, of Sciences, Arts, and Letters in uh, be April of 2007. I have published over 50 peer-reviewed papers in my career. Now, <clears throat> with regard to 9-11 research, uh, this began for me in the spring of 2005 when I heard a, a speaker saying that, uh, based on her analysis, she said, she made this rather bold statement to a large group of people. She, she was speaking about something entirely different, but she paused and she said, now if you think that those World Trade Center towers came down just because they were hit by airplanes, you have some major surprises ahead of you. And this huge audience, it must have been uh, 700 people, burst out into applause. I was one of those that was not applauding because I didn't know what she was talking about. So, uh, But the, the next uh, day or two, I got on the internet and uh, plunged into my study of uh, World Trade Center 7 and the anomalous events of 9-11. Uh, Dr. Fair has covered a number of things. I want to emphasize a few other points, and these are our, our study of the, uh, both the spheres, but particularly the active thermitic uh, red material that we discovered in the dust from 9-11. This is discussed in our paper in the Open Chemical Physics Journal published in uh, April of 2009. And I would encourage a, a careful reading of this paper. We put a lot of work into this into this uh, peer-reviewed publication. I'd like to talk first about, of all about the uh, provenience or chain of custody for the samples that we received. I'd like to mention that uh, in this paper we studied four samples in detail, four separate, uh, separately connected dust samples. Um, I received samples from several people and uh, Dr. Fair received samples directly from at least two of these collectors, I think three, 
three, three of the collectors, okay, uh, separately. So it's not like uh, someone could go to these collectors. I've heard this argument that somehow perhaps um, someone seeded these samples with nanothermite. Well, you know, folks, it's very difficult <laughs> to, to create this stuff. We, I don't know how to make this stuff. Uh, Kevin Ryan, chemist, uh, try, is trying to make this nanothermite, but it's not easy. We do have descriptions from the uh, Livermore National Laboratory in particular of how they fabricated this material, it, but to, to fabricate it is, is not so easy. First of all, the uh, iron oxide grains are uniform uh, and approximately 100 nanometers across. That's very tiny, much smaller than a human hair. The aluminum occurs in plates uh, that are about 40 nanometers across. I have no idea how to make those. I mean, th this is a high-tech material, and it's embedded in a carbon-rich matrix with... Uh, uh, okay, so uh, I've also heard the arg uh, argument that uh, perhaps the falling buildings just generated this nanothermite. Well, you know, <laughs> uh, no. We have, okay, first, as an experimental physicist, I actually took some dust from buildings that were destroyed by controlled demolition. There's a, a bank in Salt Lake City and uh, a hotel in Las Vegas. And so uh, people collected the dust and sent those into our laboratory. We looked in the dust and there were, b believe it or not, no red-gray chips, okay? <laughs> It, 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 it relates to the second law of thermodynamics, uh, but I probably won't go into that detailed argument. I'll just say, if you imagine these chips, which are highly active, it's like the ma a match head. And say you have um, the ingredients of a match head in a building. Okay, sulfur, uh, carbon, whatever else they put in the match head, and then the thing falls. And do you, you find little match head ingredients from a building falling? I mean, no. It has to do with, um, under chaotic circumstances, things go downhill, not uphill, okay? It's the second law of thermodynamics. I have to talk to students about this, excuse my impatience, but... <laughs> Second law of thermodynamics is, uh, it has to do with increasing entropy and uh, disorder, not order. These red-gray materials have very orderly um, sheets containing aluminum, these platelets, and these grains uh, containing the iron oxide, again, are of uniform size, very orderly. And furthermore, if it's from a collapsing building, where does all this carbon come from for the matrix? It's just uh, mind-boggling. Um, uh, a colleague of mine asked various nanoscientists if, if they thought that uh, a falling building could create this material, which I thought was great because he got them to consider our, our study. But 100% of these uh, nanoscientists contacted said no. There's no way that a falling building can create this uh, sophisticated uh, material that, that we report in our paper. Now, back to the chain of custody. <laughs> so it's not just from collapsing buildings. It did come from the dust of the World Trade Center. And as I said, uh, samples were sent separately to Dr. Fair and to myself. These samples all show the same red-gray material. A separate sample was sent to uh, a scientist, Mark Basil, and he, working in New England, and he also sees the same uh, active red-gray thermitic material. I have to say one thing while I'm discussing uh, the efforts by Mark Basil. He was the first one to ignite a red-gray chip and observe the spheres the tiny uh, iron-rich spheres in the residue after the red-gray chip is ignited. And so I think it's important to give him credit for that observation. Then we looked in our, our uh, residues from the red-gray chips and we also found these spheres. But I'd just like to say that that was found independently and first by uh, Mark Bissell.